Hi, my name's Phil, I like to talk about politics, and this is the Political Post Box, where each week I take about half a dozen of the most engaged with comments that have appeared on the channel from the past week and add my own thoughts onto them. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, then please subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification icon. So, on to the first one, uh, which is um, Johnson smiles and boasts that the NHS didn't have to use the extra beds he provided but he forgot to mention that the people who should have been in those beds are now dead. Um, yes, it, 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 it seems to me a bit crazy that people will look at the government announcing that, oh, we put all this critical care in place and it wasn't actually needed. And these same people will also know that we have a death toll in the tens of thousands. And they don't really put those two together and think, hang on a minute, how have we got one of the worst death tolls in the world? And it doesn't matter whether you just do it as, a, as an absolute figure or even per capita. It's one of the very worst in the world. How do you have that? And yet you're also telling us we had all this critical care that wasn't used. I don't understand, even if you only get your news from one source that doesn't have your best interest, how any sort of brain can process those two pieces of information and not ask a question at the end of it. But what this ultimately does show is that Boris Johnson is very good when it comes to made up emergencies. So counterpoint this with the Brexit situation last year. So Boris Johnson became prime minister promising he was going to deliver Brexit. And, you know, and be honest, um, yes, opposition parties did him a massive favor in the end when it came to that uh, you know getting the general election but that's not the part i'm talking about his actual first genuine success and it was a purely political success was in getting the withdrawal agreement past the pro-brexiteers in his own party theresa may had failed to do this now what had boris johnson done differently so he made the issue about the backstop, the Northern Irish backstop. It was the thing, you know, that anyone looking at, well, you need something like that. Boris Johnson made it all about the backstop, he says, we don't need the backstop. And everyone says, well, you need something in place. But he changed the narrative into his opponent saying, you need the backstop, that that's the only thing that will allow this to go through. So then, for, as far as his supporters are concerned, he gets an agreement with the EU that all that doesn't include the backstop so the he then has this political success now look at what he did to get that success all he did is he said look i quite agree that we cannot have different customs arrangements in northern ireland and the republic of ireland because that would mean a hard border that would mean a breach of the good friday agreement and actually let's be honest quite aside from the good friday agreement it, it would mean conflict again within ireland that's not acceptable. So he says, I totally get that. That's fine. Tell you what, what if I put up a customs border between Northern Ireland and Great Britain, which is something that was suggested years ago. Anyway, it wasn't even his idea or Dominic Cummings's idea or anyone else. It was something that Theresa May said no to. The EU actually came up with it. I mean, that, that was another stroke of, of brilliance, really, that Boris Johnson got a deal and hailed it as a great deal with the EU using the EU's own idea. It's just that Theresa May was against it. So you can't, you can't say, I mean, she needed the DUP to support her. So it was a Northern Ireland party, a unionist party. So there was no way she could have got that through anyway. It was impossible for her to get it through. But Boris Johnson just saw the opportunity to do that. He didn't need the DUP because he knew he wasn't going to get anything through parliament anyway. Um, he just needed the withdrawal agreement to go through. So, but that was a made up situation. Oops, sorry. <laughs> that was a completely made up situation that he gained his success in. Now you rock forward a little bit and now we have a real emergency. The coronavirus pandemic is not a political emergency. It's real, it exists. You know, you can't do something and say you've solved it because you can do that with Brexit so far, until you have to hit reality, until you have to actually properly leave the EU single market and customs union, until that point, any failures and successes are purely political. So you can claim victory or success depending on 
how well you convince the public. But coronavirus, you can't. You can't hail it a success whilst it's killing people that people know in their area. So he's clearly shown to himself to be a prime minister that is not fit for a genuine emergency. When, when he can't hide behind too many lies. Yes, he can protect his image through this. You know, he can blame, at the moment, it, I mean, I've been talking about this for some time, even the papers are now openly talking about the fact that Matt Hancock has been set up for a fall here. You know, I saw this come in and, and it's very, very likely. But, you know, so he can divert blame away from himself. He can blame the scientists, he can blame the health department, he can blame anyone around him. But he cannot solve the crisis because he's not fit to do so. He's not going to be able to solve it. Um, you know, we're going to end up in really, really bad shape as a result of it. He's not a prime minister for a, for a real emergency. He's only a prime minister for fictional emergencies, ones that he makes up. And because he's made them up, he can also dispel them as well and say, isn't this brilliant? I've dispelled it. He's a bit like someone you know, at the top of a hill with everyone else coming behind and going, ah, oh, there's a dragon, there's a dragon. And everyone's rushing, oh, I'll help you. No, don't worry. And he throws a pebble down. I'll kill the dragon. It's fine. It's run away. And everyone gets up there. Well, where's this dragon? Oh, I defeated it. It's fine. It's gone now. I saved you all. Doesn't work when there really is a dragon there. But anyway, there we go. Um, next one. So this is about... Um, something that came from the American Chamber of Commerce to the EU, who were trying to explain in, in organising a trade deal how important it was for the UK to actually stay aligned with the EU because they were saying, well, apart from anything else, EU standards are the de facto global standard. You know, the EU is the largest trading bloc. America as an individual country is the mightiest nation on earth in all sorts of ways, but from this point of view, economically, absolutely. But the EU as a whole, it's mightier, it's wealthier, has more clout than America on its own. So, you know, that's what they were trying to explain there. Of course, America still has an immense amount of wealth. People still flock to the dollar in, in tough times. That's what's helping shore up the value of the dollar at the moment. Uh, it is That is the international standard of currency, but EU standards are the international standards of this. Someone was saying here, you only have to see how many products around the world have the CE mark on them. Absolutely. Uh, it says, though Brexiteers will bang on about the kite mark. Yeah. Um, though, you know, though our standards led the way, well, that's fine. But it doesn't matter. You know, there's all sorts of standards, EU standards that were put forward by Britain. The fact is that they are now EU standards. And we have a British government that wants to diverge from those standards. Well, that's fine. But you have to understand you're not just diverging from the EU. You're, di you're diverging from the rest of the world. And they were saying here, there was someone on Radio 4 last night professing to have worked trade negotiation, uh, though the most tenuous link. What, did they just fetch the coffee or something? Said the EU will give the UK what they want at the last minute. Yeah, I think with that statement, you know they have not worked on trade negotiation. So I wonder why he no longer works on US trade. I'm pretty sure they never did. Because let's be honest, although I'll say the EU trade negotiators are the best in the world. Do you know who's the second best? US trade negotiators. Um, and... He has to get a few quid off the BBC on Ghost Shift programmes pundits. We might be doing it for free. Um, but yeah, but it is still this belief, isn't it? That And that's why I'm always torn. Does Boris Johnson genuinely want to go for the hard Brexit? Someone in the EU Commission was last week saying that it's quite clear that Boris Johnson isn't serious about a deal and he just wants to hide the impact of the hard Brexit with coronavirus. He just wants to blame everything on covid and that is one possibility, absolutely. Uh, but there is another possibility that he does think he'll get a deal if he just sits on his hands. And I don't, because I know that there are some Conservative MPs who want the hard Brexit. And I know that there, they think that that's going to be fine. There are some Conservative MPs who want the deal. They genuinely want the deal, but they think the EU are just holding out. They don't realise that the deal doesn't exist. Uh, and they just think the EU are holding out. And if we if we don't blink, that they will blink. Um, and I don't know which one Johnson is in. I don't know which camp he is in. We may find out. Well, we will find out at some point. Because if he's if he's in of the belief that the EU are going to back down, then as soon as it becomes evident that they are not, and that's going to be very, very, very late in the year, there is going to be something 
akin to mad panic. Assuming Boris Johnson is still Prime Minister by then, that is, assuming that. Anyway, next one. So, so my brother sent me this. Easement of the lockdown rules doesn't mean the pandemic is over. It only means they have a bed for you in the ICU. And this is actually more true than some people may realise, not just a little witticism. Uh, Boris Johnson has actually made no secret of the fact that he his actions, as far as the lockdown are concerned, are to stop the NHS melting down. He, he said as much. As far as he's concerned, he just needs to maintain capacity in the NHS. That is it. It's not about saving as many lives as possible. It's about doing the minimum necessary to make sure that there are hospital beds available. Um, you know, because he wants, he doesn't want to scale back the economy more than needed. Now, to be fair, no head of government would. And this is why I always cut even the likes of the, the, the buffoon a little bit of slack because it is a genuine serious problem. It's just that he is not the prime minister for a genuine serious problem. This is the problem. Um, you can't just abandon the economy. It's, it's, too, it's too easy to say, well, you know, um, the, the lives are more important. We have to... With, if we sacrifice too much of the economy, there is no country left. Um, so you have to be able to weigh up the options. But ultimately, as far as Boris Johnson is about, it's not even about maximising the number of lives saved or minimising the number lost. It is absolutely about that perception of did the NHS hold up? Did it hold up? And he wants to be able to say it did. We know it didn't because people were denied hospital care that then went on to die. I mean, if you're going to deny someone hospital care, it should be on the basis of, well, you don't need it. Well, they died, so they did need it. <laughs> and it's that simple. Tens of thousands have died. Many of, I mean, some of them will have died without really saying there was much wrong with them, but the vast majority absolutely had symptoms and someone or them themselves would have reported them. In fact, there's even people now when it comes to the tests, not getting tests. The government keep trying to say, well, the capacity is higher than demand because there are some areas that have got all this capacity and not enough people coming forward. I know of people, and I don't mean via Twitter or something where I don't really know them. I mean, actually know them that have, have got the symptoms. They've been referred. They've been told to go to a testing centre. They've gone there. And then at the testing centre, they said, we're not going to test you. Even though they're displaying symptoms. They've just, they've, there's some reason why blah, 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 we don't think you've got it. You've been referred there for the test. The way you tell them whether they've got it or not is to test them and then send them off to, for analysis. So, you know, it is absolute, absolute shit show, isn't it? Um, next one. Now, there's a couple with this one. So the first one. So this was, talk, this was the Financial Times' article explaining that because of Michael Gove's announcement, which he announced a couple of months ago, that we were going to have to uh, recruit an extra 50,000 border staff to deal with all the extra bureaucracy that leaving the EU is going to cost us, because apparently it was supposed to save us bureaucracy, now it's going to cost us. And the, and the Financial Times are pointing out that this is going to mean that we're going to have more bureaucrats just doing this. He's, he's actually going to recruit more bureaucrats than the whole EU Commission have in its entirety for all those nations. And someone's saying here, lot, it's going to be an outsourced bureaucracy, just another way of moving taxpayers' money to private companies like Serco, etc. Mission accomplished. Absolutely. I think that is absolutely the case. Um, everything they have done with this coronavirus crisis, everything they're going to do, they have done so far with Brexit and are going to do with Brexit, is absolutely how do we funnel more public money into the pockets of people who will chuck us a few quid in terms of a donation. And it is... It, it, it really is corruption when you look at how a conservative government operates. You know, a company donates, whether it's to a particular minister or just to the party in general, and it's not very much. I mean, at least in America, you have to donate millions to be able to get a few backhanders from government. Not in this country, you know. I mean, the most ridiculous bargain that I remember is a few years ago when Jeremy Hunt was health minister and someone donated £20,000 to him and they got like a £6 million NHS contract. 
dear. I mean, that's a bargain, that is. Um, so, yeah, if we... But it will absolutely be about that. Because from the Conservatives' point of view, they get a few quid, they get their donations bunged up, and and it's not their money they're spending. You know, it's public money. Um, and they justify it because they don't believe in the state anyway. They, they, they don't mind raising taxes, I noticed, to, to chuck it into private hands, but there you go. But then someone else said, I'm going to have to disagree with this next comment. Someone in reply to this said, it says, private supply is okay. If it's competent. No. Anyway, it says, after all, you want to pay for private expertise. Any idiot can recruit the unemployed to do a bad job. Welcome to subcontracting UK style. No, right, okay. Private supply is okay. No, it's not. Right, there's two things wrong with this statement, I'm going to say. One, first, it's not because these people that are being employed are going to be people that are going to need to be employed for a long time. Because we need people to be able, if we're going to have more complicated customs arrangements, we're going to need the extra bureaucrats to be able to deal with all the forms. So that makes getting a private company nonsensical. The only argument ever, ever for contracting something out is when it's a time limited job. You know, let's say you need to get a plumber in to a government building for something that goes wrong every few years. So you don't pay a plumber to be there for whenever it's needed. So, OK, you get a plumber in just for that one job. Now, you could still argue if it's a government building, you could just hire a plumber who can cover a whole region or something if necessary. So I still don't agree with it even then. But that's the only way you can possibly justify it in a way that I will not roll my eyes. This is not a short term thing. This is a long term thing. I mean, I'm hoping it's short term. I'm hoping people come to their senses and demand we go straight back into the EU with all possible haste. But the government are proceeding as if this is for the long term. So that means you don't have this argument. So it's inevitably better and cheaper for us to train our own staff and have them working, not having to pay their wages and pay the accommodation and offices and resources and stuff and profit on top of it for a private company. But then there's the second level. You say, after all, you want to pay for private expertise. What private expertise? There is no private expertise for this job because this job entails looking at forms that don't even bloody well exist yet. The government hasn't actually worked out what its customs arrangements are yet. There is no expertise in the world for this job. None at all. Doesn't exist. And when that expertise eventually does emerge, these people exist to check forms. That's all. They're just going to be employed. The poor buggers who are hauling the stuff or exporting or importing the stuff have to fill the bloody forms in. We're talking about people who will be filling in forms to say they've checked the forms that some other poor bastards had to fill in. That's all. Form checking and filling in a form to say you've checked the other form or God knows how many forms. So now, no, 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 having that one. No. Next one. So PMQ, so I was talking about uh, how Boris Johnson, his only PMQs against Keir Starmer so far, um, completely done over. He really was completely done over. It says here, PMQs really needs to be managed more like a courtroom examination with the speaker directing the PM to answer the question that was asked and be held in contempt if the PM dodges or refuses to address the question. If they won't do that, they should rename it to something a bit more honest like opposition questions that Prime Minister doesn't answer. In reality, you can't do that. Uh, the bottom line is it's not a court. Well, it's not a court. Um, the Prime Minister is under no legal obligations in the House of Commons at all. Um, you know, it's a, it's a convention, which is why, of course, Boris Johnson has, has very frequently dodged Prime Minister's questions. And I don't just mean the recent ones. Yes, he was ill and then he was having a kid. I'm not talking about those times. But even beforehand, he very frequently dodged Prime Minister's questions. And he will do so again. I, you know, there's a lot of people um, on either side of politics. If you were to ask them if Boris Johnson is going to turn up, say, to this Wednesday's Prime Minister's questions, you know, quite his supporters will say, yeah, of course he is. Of course he is. If you ask them to bet the farm on it, even his supporters will go, uh, uh, I mean, he's, he might have a reason not to, you know, because that's the thing with Boris Johnson. 
you're never actually certain that he's ever going to turn up. In fact, I wouldn't have put it past him because he was late to last week's Prime Minister's questions. I wouldn't have put it past him to have tried to get Dominic Raab to do it again first, saying, oh, I'm not quite up to it, Dom. Do you reckon? Do you? And he probably went, you're having a laugh. I've already had to do two against him. I'm not doing another. Um, and if he could have got Dominic Raab to do it, I wonder if actually that would have been the case there. So, yeah, you're never quite sure. Um, but he, he is under no legal obligation. It is just a convention. You know, and the speaker cannot compel the prime. It's not up to the speaker to judge whether or not an answer that anyone gives, whether it's the prime minister or a different minister or indeed any MP. But it's only ministers who really answer questions in the Commons. It's not up to the speaker to judge whether that answer is satisfactory or not. Remember, the, the speaker is supposed to be apolitical. Um, but I will say this on the courtroom side of it. There are some people who are suggesting that at the moment it is sort of like that. And in many ways, that is playing to Keir Starmer's strengths. Now, I have to say, when it became apparent that Keir Starmer was going to be conducting his first few weeks or even months of Prime Minister's questions, under these circumstances, I was disappointed. I thought, what we really need is he needs, right from the bat, to be able to go in full fire and fury and get in you know, opposition MPs, not just the Labour MPs, which are now much diminished, but opposition MPs in general really roaring. Um, but in actual fact, Keir Starmer is, uh, is an experienced courtroom practitioner. He was the director of pu you know, public prosecutions. And the atmosphere in the House of Commons, remember when you've got hardly anyone in there, you haven't got all the brain and the roaring, which actually plays to Boris Johnson's strengths. So, but it is much more like a courtroom and, and potentially that is playing to Starmer's strengths at the moment and it is giving him an opportunity to really expose Boris Johnson because you could, you could I mean, let's face facts, most people are not going to watch PMQs, but let's say they did, you know, but you weren't really clued up. So normally you could watch a PMQs and the Prime Minister would start, or the leader of the opposition would stand up, it would have been the last time it happened like this, Jeremy Corbyn, of course. And he would say something. And he, it may well be an absolutely valid point. Of course, it generally was. Um, but then the Prime Minister would stand up and he would say a thing. He'd go, oh, waffle, waffle, waffle. And then sit and all the Conservative MPs would roar their approval. And someone watching it wouldn't go, he didn't really answer that question. They'd go, oh, it's got a right roar of approval there. He must have said something clever. He's on this. He knows what he's doing, our Boris. Can't do that now. Can't do it. Now what happens is, Boris Johnson, sorry, tries to, to, you know, blather his way through a question. There's no roaring there. Someone looks at it. And if they weren't sure that he hadn't really answered the question, next thing that happens is Keir Starmer stands up and goes, no, that, that, that's not answering the question, is it really? Or he'll do something else to contradict the Prime Minister immediately. At which point, if you're watching it now, you can be under no illusions that Boris Johnson knows what he's talking about. He's been utterly exposed in this sort of environment and there's nothing at all going for him. So it could be a very, very uncomfortable time for him. Boris Johnson, that is. Uh, next one. Last one, in fact, now. So it says here, Johnson does not care about anything as long as he can pretend to play PM. I'm not sure if that little line is an allusion to the fact that potentially people think that the real power is Dominic Cummings and Boris Johnson just gets to be the puppet king on the throne. But anyway, he sells out anything and anyone. And I think Matt Hancock is going to be the first to realise that. So it is no problem for him to join anything, even rejoin the EU, as long as the low information voting Tories do not get it. Um, I mean, you're quite right in terms of, you know, his general beliefs. I, it, he, I've always said he doesn't really have strong political beliefs. He does have political beliefs, but... It, I mean, when it came to Brexit, of course, he very famously, and this is not speculation, this actually happened. He very famously uh, wrote a piece in the Telegraph, which is the paper he wrote for while he was still an M while he was an MP. And um, he was going to set out his position on Brexit. And he wrote two articles. One was a passionate defence of our membership of the EU. And one was a passionate argument for leaving the EU. 
and he ummed and ahed about it and he eventually decided to be on the Brexit side and it was for political gain. So what he wanted to remember was to become prime minister. Now, I always felt that he made the wrong decision. I don't mean felt the wrong decision because I am pro-EU. I mean just, just from an objective point of view because it went pretty badly for him at first. The only reason he became prime minister in the end, remember, was because the opposition didn't stop him doing so. They had the numbers to stop him. They just didn't. Um, but he wanted to be the Prime Minister to follow David Cameron. Now, if he'd have been on the side of, or, or let's say the, the, the referendum had been on the side of staying in the EU, this is what would have happened. David Cameron would have left anyway. Not at the same time he did, but he was going to leave that parliament. He wasn't going to fight another general election, at which point there'd be a leadership election. Now, this was Boris Johnson's calculation. He thought, if I represent the Eurosceptic wing of the party, which are quite powerful now, then I'll have their support. But he won't have to instigate another referendum because the referendum will have already been done. He wanted to be on the losing side. So it was, yeah, so you're, you're quite right. He doesn't care whether the UK remains in or out of the EU. He only cares that he gets to carry on being prime minister. But I have to say, he's, you know, he, it's not looking good for him. I think the knives aren't out for him just yet because his approval rating is still okay. A few more months and I think they will slip quite badly. Um, as long as the opposition can keep opposing what he's doing without making it sound like political point scoring and it will start to fall. And when that happens, it will eventually become a point where it'll be a liability, at which point he's going to discover that the Conservatives stay in power through a number of means, and one of them is brutal honesty. When their leader is a liability, they don't stand by them. They stand behind them, but the only reason they stand behind them is because it's easier to then knife them in the back. And, and that is what is going to happen to him. Um, but it'll bring me no joy to see it because the regime will remain in place as a result of it. Just at the moment, Boris Johnson is lumping all of the blame onto the scientists and Matt Hancock, and he's going to throw them under the bus. So the party will throw him under the bus when it's his time to be the one to take the blame. That's just how the party works. But anyway, that's it for this week. Hope you found the video interesting. If you did, don't forget to click the like button. If you'd like to support the channel further, then please also click the Patreon link for details. And until next time, I'll see you later.